In Christ Alone, hymn number 239, In Christ Alone. Let's sing out this morning. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. His cornerstone is solid ground. Firm from the fiercest drought and storm. What heights above, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in of Christ I stand in Christ alone to God flesh fullness of God in helpless faith this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on the cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied on him was laid here in the land of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, born with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your grace, Lord, for the mercy you bestow upon each of us. Lord, and we just pray that we can, in fact, abide in you, Lord, and that you will abide in us. Lord, make us vessels, Lord. Make us vines, or make us the branches of the vine, Lord, so that we can bear fruit through you. And we know, Lord, that we can only bear fruit when we are abiding in you, and we thank you for that. And we thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us or forsake us, and that you're always there with us. And Lord, we just pray this morning that if there happens to be someone here this morning who isn't abiding in you, that doesn't know you, Lord, as his or her personal Savior, that today would be the day that the Holy Spirit would move on their hearts. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you would bless the service this morning, that you would be with the pastor as he brings your word to us, Lord. Be with the music, Lord. And Lord, be with the uh, children's church in the back as well. And Lord, we think of those who aren't here this morning because of uh, travel or, or illness or for some other reason, Lord. And we just pray your blessing upon them. And Lord, again, we would just pray that everything that's done this morning in this service would bring glory and honor and would be pleasing to you and we ask all this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. We are in, cha we're in John chapter 15. John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. 
He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command. Henceforth I call you not servants, for a servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things which I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You can remain seated for our next song, 83, Merciful God. Merciful God, overpounding in love, faithful to all who draw near you, hearing the cries of the humble in heart, showing the cross they may cling to. Helpless I come, broken in sin, found at the feet of your mercy. Father, forgive, may my sin be remembered no more. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, faithful through times we have failed you, selfish in thought and uncaring in deed, foolish in word and ungrateful. Spirit of God, conquer our hearts with love that flows from forgiveness. us to yield and return to the mercy of God. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, faithful to keep us from falling, guiding our ways with your fatherly our faith with each testing. God be the day, struggles will end, for us will gaze on your glory. Then we will stand overwhelmed by the mercy of God. Go ahead and stand. Constantly abiding. Hymn number 390. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I've a peace that has come here to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly 
once and we abide in rapture divine. He never leaves me long, l i v whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. All the world seems to see. Of a Savior and King, when He sweetly came to my heart, troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art! Constantly abiding, Jesus. Abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely. Whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee. Jesus is mine. This treasure I have. In a temple of clay, while here on His footstool I roam, and He's coming to take me some glorious stay over there to my heavenly home, constantly abiding. Jesus is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. seated. A um, couple of uh, things just to announce. Uh, make sure you check your bulletins for various things. This coming Wednesday, we will resume our church out, uh, outdoors. Uh, I, I'm hearing good weather this week is what it, what it looks like. A little bit less hot, so um, hopefully that will be the case. And uh, so we will have the, uh, the grilling as well uh, at 6.30. That will start. Um, tonight, we are going to all meet here And we're going to start a, a series, I don't know how long it will go, um, but it's, it, the, the title of the series, it, I'm going to call it a wisdom series, it's on, it's, the title of the series is going to be Tech Wise Family, the Tech Wise Family, and we are, we are, and by family I don't just mean individual families, I mean a church family and everything else, we are, um, Technology can be a really good thing, a very helpful thing, but it can also be a very a great, uh, a real hindrance if we don't know the prop how to put it in its proper place. And statistically, it is the number one struggle that parents are having um, in in raising their children. Now they're saying that the biggest struggle is how what to deal with all how to deal with all of this technology coming out. And、there's a very wise man who's written a very good book by that title, the Tech Wise Family,、uh, that we're going to be working from, and just trying to help us think through、um, how we can use technology for the, in a helpful way, but also not for it not to become a harmful thing for our families. And I want to say that my approach is not going to be to throw away your cell phones and computers and everything that. I have a cell phone, a computer, an iPad. I have three screens on my on my desk. I mean, I am very, I'm I'm probably as pastors go a little more on the techie side than most. So I'm not.、Uh, Eric is agreeing with me back there. I think he shook his shook his head. So that's good. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if they're going <laughs> back there, then I'm I would be a little worried about it. <laughs> but anyway, but so I'm not a, at all going to be pro- a proponent that we become. 
Quakers or something, but, um, uh, but we do need to be careful. And, and there are cautions as I, I it's just, we, and this is not in the realm of morality. It's not, you're not immoral if you use a cell phone or don't or a, a smartphone. It's, it's in the realm of wisdom. And God has a lot of principles in his word to help us to be wise with these things. And so I think it will be a very helpful series for us. I will tell you that I just think it's very needed as I talk with t- parents of teens and sometimes teenagers as well, and I see and I, I hear the things that they're struggling with and, um, on multiple levels. It used to be when I was a teenager that the main concern was, uh, not even a teenager, like when did the internet come out? I don't know. I know Al Gore invented it, but uh, I don't remember exactly when it came out. But anyway, I'm joking about that. Um, but anyway, I remember the main concern was, was whether pornography would come up on the screen or not. And, and, and guard it. it's way more involved than that now. There, it's not, that isn't the primary concern even anymore. It's, that is a concern, but it's not, there is a lot more to it that we need to be concerned about now. And so um, we're going to delve into that and hopefully use biblical principles to be able to navigate a, an area that it's not going away. If you think the technology is going away, then, you know, it, it's not going to go away. We have to learn how to deal with it. And the thank, thankfully, the God's word is such that it has such wisdom that it allows us to, um, it, it, it gives us principles that will work in any culture and in any kinds of contexts that we find ourselves, that Christians find themselves in. So we just need to have the wisdom to know how to apply those things correctly. And so hopefully tonight we'll be able to, to do that. I really encourage you to be here. You say, well, I don't have a family. I'm single. <laughs> it's still for you. I'm, it, this really applies to everyone. And uh, even in our own church body, it, it applies to. And so I think it'll be very helpful for us. Um, I, I think it's a needed and helpful thing. So 5.30 tonight for that. So keep, keep that in mind. 5.30 we'll meet here. Uh, in the sanctuary, we'll sing some hymns, and then we'll get into that sort of very practical lesson. We'll have discussion and things in a group setting here, and I think it'll be it'll be helpful. All right, gentlemen, if you come forward for the for our offering, and let's pray together. Our Father, as we review of such an important topic. Abiding in Christ this morning, and we remind ourselves of the utter and absolute importance of staying connected to Christ. We thank you, Lord, that it is because of Christ and his spirit and his word that gives us the ability to do just that. And we are living in a society, we are living in a world that is increasingly complex, it seems, and difficult to navigate. But we have the truth of your word. And in any culture, in any context, we are able to stay connected to Christ. Various challenges come up in our lives with regard to this. And Lord, as we identify those challenges this morning, I pray that this would just be a real help for us in reminding ourselves of a series that we went through over nine months ago, around nine months ago to continue to abide in Christ. And Lord, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for all that he has done for us. He has, uh, he is, has the preeminence. He has all authority and all power. He has all ability. He is our Redeemer and our Lord and our God. And he has made such incredible provision for us to be able to be rightly related to you. And I pray, Lord, that not only we would would learn how to do that in a better way and be equipped how to do that in a better way today, but I pray, Lord, that we would just be reminded of the awesome privilege that we have as Christians to do that, to be connected to, to you through Christ, who is the vine, and Lord, I pray that when, as there are potential hindrances us in, in us um, with, with bearing fruit, which is Christ's role, 
his job to do that, his role to do that. I pray that we would be able to work those things out, and there would be even a time of self-application and self-examination in our service today. Lord, though, what we want to do is really honor and worship you with our lives, with everything that we have, with all of our being, and we pray as we worship you that we would just be grateful for your mercy in our lives and your goodness and your and all of those things, Lord, that, that cause us to just say you're worthy of our worship and our praise. And I pray that we would set aside the distractions that are so easily invade our hearts and our minds, and we would just focus on you this morning. We pray that as we give to you, we would do so knowing that this is your work, and in fact, it is your principal work in the world. And I pray, Lord, that we would give Uh, not grudgingly nor of necessity, but that we would give cheerfully. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Before our last song this morning, we're going to introduce our next song of the month, which many of you might recognize. It's a very uh, traditional hymn with a, a slightly different chorus. And verse. Chosen 
On that note, let's stand and sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. And the children will be dismissed on the third and last verse. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells of love, a Savior's love, who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart the children can be dismissed. The deepest woe who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. You may be seated. Take your Bibles and turn to a familiar passage of Scripture, John chapter 15. John 15. According to my records, I preached this through this passage uh, in October of last year, about nine months ago, nine to ten months ago. And in fact, we actually took an entire month to, to look at this concept of abiding in Christ simply because it is, it is of utmost importance for the Christian. And today what we want to do is we're going to look at it again as a reminder. But as we do this, I want us to do some self-reflecting, maybe a little differently than we did before. Nine months ago, we looked at this, and there was, there was a sense in which some of these concepts, many of you knew of these concepts, but they were developed um, fairly thoroughly over the four weeks that we looked at these things. But I think it's such an important concept that I'm sort of, I'm returning to this because because we have such good forgetters. <laughs> and we get on with life, and we get on with the busyness, and the difficulties, and the distractions, and the, all those things in life, and we forget. And we get sidetracked in this fellowship, this connectedness that Christ desires to have with his children. In fact, this is in the middle of a text that is called the Upper Room Discourse, as you recall. And also, in fact, this was spoken to Christ by his, from Christ to his disciples because these were vital things that they needed to know before Christ went to the cross. If you think of the illustration that Christ mentions here of him being the true vine and the the disciples and all of us who know Christ being the branches. If you think just generally, what is his point? His point is simply this. You must, you must abide in me. You must stay connected to Christ. You have, it's as though Christ is saying, you've got one objective in life. You've got one goal. You've got one thing to focus on. The father is the husband, and he's the planner. Christ is the vine. I'm the one that produces the fruit. You've got one goal. Stay connected to me. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. That's my paraphrase of that, that passage. You're going to be in big trouble because you're going to be useless. 
And in fact, you're going to be torn up and chewed up and spit out by the world. All of that is in this passage, essentially. So it is absolutely and vitally important that we, that we maintain not only our mental understanding, but our practice of the concepts in this chapter. Now, to sort of illustrate how we're going to approach this, I'd like to refer you back to a time-tested tradition over many years during Christmas time of putting up Christmas lights. How many of you all just enjoy putting up Christmas lights on your trees? I'm glad there's a few weird ones in the room. <laughs> sorry, sorry, but hope I didn't offend. I don't enjoy that. How many of you remember the, the old days when, they're not really this way anymore, I don't think, but, but the old days when, um, when if you had one bulb that was not seated correctly, the whole thing wouldn't work. You, you all remember those days? Okay. Uh, that, it was, it's already frustrating enough to put up Christmas lights. Back then, man, I mean, one thing went wrong, and you, know, you put the whole thing up, and something like maybe a day later, the, the, the whole thing would go out, and you're looking at every little bulb, but is it seated right, and is it... St- I mean, you know, the truth is there... Why? Because there's got to be a, a, a flow of electricity that runs through that, and there's basically only one circuit, and if it's broken at any point, it doesn't work. Well, this connectedness that we need to have and that Christ wants us to have, this connectedness, sometimes there are, it gets short-circuited by certain things. I have actually seven short circuits in this passage, shorted circuits uh, in this message today. I don't know that we'll get through all of them. We might, this might be a two-part message, but but I I really think that it's just absolutely necessary to say, okay, um, if I'm not consistently abiding in Christ, how, how, where am I getting short-circuited? Well, we're going to need the Lord's help with this, aren't we? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, as we look at your word this morning and we see a very familiar passage, one that we have studied with some thoroughness, but as all of your word is, it's much easier to understand than it is to apply. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to to do some reflecting today and that this would just be helpful in, in identifying Uh, shorted circuits that are keeping us from really being connected to you as you would desire. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the passage is in in the context of Christ talking to his disciples. He mentions in the passage in the previous chapter of the work of, of, uh, of knowing the Father and being in Christ. And John 14, 20, it actually says, And that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. So he now gives this illustration of what it means to be in Christ, and for Christ to be in us, and for Christ to be in the Father. How how, That's really hard to understand. So he gives us this picture of a branch connected to a tree, Christ being that vine or that tree, and we're the branches, and and, and this is a very helpful illustration for us to understand how this is all supposed to work. We begin in verse 1, and we see verses 1 through 3. We're going to see the different roles that are involved in this process of abiding in Christ. Verse 1 says this, I am the true vine. Christ identifies himself this way. Now, in the Old Testament, we won't take the time to look at this, this but in the Old Testament... The vine was actually mentioned as the nation of Israel in Psalm 80. Christ is now saying, I am the true vine. You need to look to me. The nation of Israel, with its ceremonial uh, sacrificial system and the center of the presence of God being in the middle of the 12 tribes of Israel and all that took place there, it was the vine. That was the center of everything. But now Christ says, I'm the center of everything. I am the vine. I'm re- there is a sense in which he is, for now anyway, replacing Israel, particularly when it comes to spiritual vitality. 
how do we maintain spiritual vitality? How are the disciples going to do this? Well, it's not going to be by looking at the nation of Israel anymore. It's going to be by being connected to Christ. He then says this. He says, and by the way, we need to remember this. This is important. Christ being the vine, he is the fruit producer. He's the one that produces the fruit. We don't produce the fruit, folks. Christ produces the fruit through us as the branches. We then see in verse, in the same verse here that, Christ, that says the father is the husbandman or the gardener. Now when we think of a gardener, we may think of sort of a maintenance gardener who, who uh, maintains the garden, and certainly the father has a role that way, but there, the husbandman or the gardener in this passage is much more than that. It is the one who owns the garden, who plans it all out, who makes sure that everything is being properly done in order that the most amount, the best fruit and most amount of fruit possible uh, comes from that vine and those branches and that garden. The Father is the gardener. Now, why is this important to know? We must understand that the Father's role is to be an overseer. And in fact, we see in verse 2 that the overall goal of all of it is to bear fruit. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. This is the Father. And every branch uh, that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So the Father's goal in our lives is to set forth a plan for us that we would be able to produce or to, to bear the most fruit possible. And that brings us to the first possible shorted circuit in our lives, where we try to be the gardener. The Father has a plan. The Father has, He knows exactly how you can bear the most fruit possible. But do you know that you and I, we get in the way because we try to plan things out ourselves? We want our own way. We want to do things our own way. We think we have the plan. We forget that Proverbs says that a man's heart devises his own way, but the Lord directs his steps. And we get in trouble when we we plan out our lives and we say, we've got this plan, and we forget that we can't do that. Now, there's nothing wrong with setting goals. There's nothing wrong with establishing objectives. But folks, hold them loosely, because the Father is the one that has the plan, and He has to be the one to adjust us and direct us and to know how to prune us and know what to do. And when we start taking over the plan and we start taking control and saying, oh, I, I want my plan to come into play, and my plan has to be what it's supposed to be, and, and when we get frustrated because my plan is not going the way that I want it to go. And it's not working out the way I expect. You know, we get real frustrated when things aren't the way we expect them to be, right? And it's somehow like we've forgotten that it's actually the Father that is the planner. He's in control. He's the one that knows what's going to happen. By the way, there's great comfort in that. Aren't you thankful that there's a Heavenly Father that knows you better than you know yourself, knows exactly what He has planned for you, and knows exactly how to get you there? And we as Christians need to be very careful that we don't try to to control where God wants to be and the Father needs to be in control. We do not want to thwart His plan or or fret or fear or be bothered when things don't go the way we think they ought to go. Because we must understand and accept that God is in control. Let me illustrate it this way. When I was first going to college, I had a very um, good idea that the Lord wanted me to go into the ministry. Well, when I hit my second year, everybody everybody told me horror stories about Greek class. I mean, everybody, you know, my first year, they said, ah, freshman year's a breeze. But man, when you get into Greek, you know, I'd talk to upperclassmen that are pastoral ministries majors, and they'd say, man, you get into Greek, that's going to be your, that's the weed out class for for pastors. And, you know, there, there's a sense in which I started getting a little fearful about this. And, um, 
I'm, but I remember thinking to myself, wait, wait a minute. What am I afraid of? If God wants me to pastor, and I need to be best, and the best way to be equipped is to know Greek, well, then God's going to equip me to do what I need to do if he wants me to be a pastor. And if he doesn't want me to be a pastor, that's okay. He'll do what he needs to do in my life to put me where he wants me to go. You know, when you think that way, it's like the fear leaves you. You don't need to be afraid anymore because you're trying to follow God's plan, not your own. Now, it's nothing wrong with having a goal, but if God redirects you, don't say to yourself, well, I'm a failure at my own goal. Say, no, no, God didn't have that goal for me. Because the reality is God has equipped you to do exactly what he wants you to do. Here's what he hasn't equipped you to do, what you want to do. Does that make sense? I mean, he hasn't equipped you to do everything you want to do necessarily, but he has equipped you to do exactly what he wants you to do. And so when we leave the plan to him, and when we decide that we're going to follow one step at a time, we set goals, fine, but if God, doesn't, if God directs us another way, that's okay. When we have that kind of malleability in our lives, if you will, if we begin to, when we have that kind of flexibility, then we are going to be able to continue to stay connected to him. And we find then in this passage as well that how the Father works is that he knows exactly where to prune us. Did you, did you notice that in verse 2? He wants to prune us. It says that every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring, bring forth more fruit. I did a little research on olive trees and when they're best. I, I was studying this uh, yesterday, actually, and thinking through this a little bit. And I thought, you know, I wonder where, when olive trees are supposed to be pruned. So I, took, I looked at a secular website. Um, had nothing in mind. You know, there's no connection here as far as what they thought. And... Um, to see when they're pruned. And you know, when, you know when you prune an olive tree? Right before it produces fruit. And they said in this secular website that the reason that you prune is you need to, if you prune correctly, you will, you will, it was like I'm reading the Bible here, which is, I wasn't, but if you prune correctly, you'll produce more fruit than you would otherwise. More olives. And they said the reason that you, prune, that you have to know exactly how to prune the fruit correctly so that all of the branches get enough, of, enough sunlight to be able to, to flower and to produce the kind of fruit that you're supposed to produce. Folks, that's exactly what God does in our lives. He prunes us. That brings me to shorted circuit number two. And you know what this one is, I think, already. We... In some way or another, we resist God's pruning. We don't like the idea of God's pruning in our lives, and we resist it. You know, Peter said it this way, don't think it's strange when fiery trials come upon you to try you. Don't think that to be strange. The Bible says in Hebrew, and, and here's how he does it sometimes. He does it th certainly through our circumstances. We will go through trials and difficulties. We'll go under the pressure cooker. We'll go under those kinds of things. And what we tend to do, and we'll lose our connectivity to Christ if we do this, what we tend to do is we sort of snap back and say, why am I going through this? Instead of realizing, you know, maybe God is doing this in my life to prune me so that I can go from producing fruit to producing more fruit. Hebrews 12 says it this way, No chastening of the present time seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The second short circuit in our life, shorted circuit in our lives that can occur that keeps us from abiding in the vine is that we resist God's pruning. Now, I don't think when we get pruned by God, we have to say, yippee joy, like we have to suddenly be happy, like, like joy, like bubbly about it or something. That would be weird. But folks, on the other hand, for, we need to sit back sometimes and we need to look at our trials and we need to look at what we're going through and we need to set, 
we need to observe what we're going through and we need to say, you know what, maybe what God is doing is pruning me so I can bring forth more fruit. And if we resist that pruning and we, we sort of kick back and kick against that pruning, we can become disconnected from the vine altogether. Sometimes we become almost angry at God. We would never, we, sometimes we wouldn't say it, but we begin to despair in our circumstances that we have to be very careful about this. Folks, we cannot abide in the vine if we are resisting God's pruning. We've got to go through it. Every, but every branch does. You say, boy, that is depressing. Folks, the key then is to realize that on the other side of that, you're going to produce more fruit. Don't you want to produce more fruit for God? The answer to being able to do that is to willingly undergo God's pruning in your life so that you can indeed produce more fruit. A.W. Tozer said it this way, It is doubtful whether God can use a man greatly until he has first hurt him deeply. And we don't like that. But the truth of the matter is, that is the case in our lives as Christians. The Christian life will necessarily include pruning. And we ought not resist God's pruning in our lives, knowing that there is, there is a result, a, a fruit that occurs from the pruning. It says here then in verse 3, Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. We move then from the role of Christ being the vine and the role of the husbandman to the role then of, of what Christ has done to us positionally. He says in this passage, you are clean. Now if you recall way back from John chapter 3, you'll recall then that it says that we need to be born both of water and of the word. And we back then did an extended discussion on this in Ezekiel 36, we see that the word has a ref you put all this together and the, the water in that passage has a, is a reference to the word. That is, the word is a cleansing agent. And in Ezekiel 36 verses 35 through 27, you have the concept of the spirit of God using the word of God to establish and to do things with the Word of God, particularly this cleansing work. Now, when we think of the work of the Holy Spirit, often we think in terms of a day-by-day, -day ongoing thing that the Spirit of God does in our lives or, and can do in our lives, the filling of the Spirit of God, and certainly that is a very important thing for us to understand. But that's not what he's talking about in verse 3. He's actually referencing the initial cleansing work of the Spirit of God in the, person, in the believer's life, where he, he places us in the body of Christ, the baptism of the Spirit, and he indwells us, the sealing of the Spirit. There are certain things that the Spirit of God does when we come to Christ that establishes who we are in Christ, our position in Christ. It is not something that's dependent upon us at all. It's not something that we can do anything about, essentially, once we have truly come to Christ. We are established. We are a son of the King. We are children of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. There are certain things that are established, and we are cleansed by the Word of God by no merit of our own, and there is nothing we can do to reverse that, that position. It does bring me, though, to short circuit number three we stop identifying with our position in Christ. Let me explain how this works. This is something that is very, seems to be very prevalent in our culture. We, become, we are somewhat enamored with discovering ourselves. You notice that? Um, think of different Disney lyrics. Actually, be, watch out for Disney lyrics. I'm just gonna, that's a for free thing. But, um, you know, a lot of times they talk about be true to yourself and be into yourself and 
be have you know make sure you're a lot of things about yourself basically in those Disney lyrics. So just be careful. Some of them are good actually. Some of them are not. But you ever see on Facebook they they something flashes up and says find out whether you're this or this. How many of you are inclined to go and well I want to know what I want to know what I am. I mean I've done it before. Like hmm, I wonder what I am. Find out if you're a lion or a bear. I mean <laughs> There are all kinds of things. Some of them, I go, well, I've done about two or three of them, and now I just think, that's ah, just dumb, <laughs> usually. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, if you did them, if you do them, I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm just saying that some of them are really dumb. <laughs> anyway, but there is this human propensity to really, like, know who you are. And it seems to be in our culture to really do that. I, I think of terms like people say, I'm, I'm a foodie. My wife said that today. She said the other day, she said, We're foodies. I said, What? What is that? We were at a restaurant, we were being picky about what we were eating, and she said, We're foodies, that's why. I'm like, we're, what, 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 what is that? I know I like food. Don't, you know, you could just look at me and tell that. I mean, what, I gotta go on a diet. I seriously do. Anyway, um, the fall, fall's coming, right? You know, we gotta have our fun in the summer and the fall. Anyway, that's totally beside this point. But, but you have this, or I'm an athlete. Or I'm a computer geek, or I'm this or that. What you know? I mean, some of the or we identify by our job position. I am this. We begin to find our value in those kinds of things. Well, my value is in this job, or this position, or this title, or that kind of thing. Can I tell you that some of that? By the way, if you come up to me and say I'm a I'm an athlete or, some, or I, I'm into sports. Don't, I'm not going to say, oh, boy, you're, you need to find your position in Christ. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Okay. But we do need to be careful. Who you are in Christ is what really matters. And the glorious thing about that is that doesn't change. Other things can change. You lose your job, and you might not be able to find value. Are we, should we despair if we lose our job, our position? Some people do. They find all of their value in their position, and they don't know how to operate anymore. They, don't, they can't see their value because they've lost their position at their job. They go into depression and despair. Folks, that should not be the case for a Christian. Our position is that we are in Christ. We have been cleansed by Him. Sometimes it occurs because we, we are not really allowing, we're not really realizing the forgiveness that God has given us in sin, that, sin in our lives. The Bible tells us if we agree with God about our sin, then he's forsaken, then, then, and, and we've forsaken our sin, we've confessed it, then he, he, it's, we're, he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And frankly, he already has because of our position in Christ. And there is a connectedness that needs to occur in fellowship that we were restored to that, but sometimes it's all as though we think God can't forgive that sin. Well, who do you think you are that God can't forgive your sin? Is Christ's work on the cross not good enough? We really need to think through this. Sometimes what we do in, in short-circuiting this particular problem, sometimes what we do is, um, is we allow our 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 actions to define us, our opinions or our, our, our behavior to define us. Well, I do this because this is who I am. No, no, you don't do that because of who you are. We get it backwards. I am in Christ, therefore I serve him. I don't serve him so that I can be in Christ. I remember uh, when I was... Um, I was in Pennsylvania. I, we did a yard sale. And uh, at this yard sale, um, I, I borrowed one of those canopy things. Now I have my own. But uh, I borrowed one at the time. And I broke it. And so I went immediately to the sports place uh, that it was bought from. I, I, I knew where the the friend of mine bought it from, and I bought him another one. I just, I didn't even ask, I just went and bought it. And he said, oh man, I could have fixed that, that would have been okay. And I said, no, 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 this is just who I am. 
I actually took all of the proceeds from the from the uh, yard sale to go buy that canopy. It took, it took all of it. So I was like, you know, net gain of zero. Um, and, and he was kind of upset, and I said, no, this, this is just who I am. You know, actually, that was a bad way to put it. It's not who I am. I, we, we, you, you, we don't do in order to be. We are in Christ, and therefore we do. And we have to be very careful that we understand the distinction. There's a fine line but we need to understand the distinction between those things. Because here's what happens when you can't do the way you think you ought to do. If your position is based upon what you do, you suddenly will despair because you're not who you think you are. Does that, you follow that? And you become, people have identity crises, 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 because they think they're something and then they do certain things and then actually... They find out they're not who they thought they were. What a bunch of drama. You are who you are, not because of what you've done, not because of what you will do. You are who you are because of Christ. And aren't you glad about that? That will never change. And it's all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And our relationship with Christ, our fellowship with Christ, is not built upon our actions, our behavior. It's built upon Christ. Now, here's the thing. Here's what's amazing about this. If we get this right, then our actions will be what they're supposed to be. And they will be consistently right. And we will live for God correctly. And we will do what we're supposed to do and serve Him faithfully. So it's not as though we won't do that. We will do that. In fact, that's evidence of the fact that we are connected to Christ. But we've got to make sure that it's all based upon an established position that's based upon who Christ is. Folks, it's exactly why, the old, that why, why you couldn't follow the law in the Old Testament, why they were not able to do it. Because the, it was, the, the role was reversed. They were who they were based upon their behavior. It doesn't work. We're too weak. And so we have to understand that. We've got to be settled in our foundation, foundationally about who we are in Christ. We will never consistently be able to abide in Christ until we are settled in who we are in Christ. And so we have to remember this. Then we find here, that's the roles and all that, and there are actually there are three short circuits that we came into, but now we are moving now to understanding the very nature of a body in Christ. And I want to remind us about a few things in this passage here. We pick up here in verses 3 through 5. We've already read verse 3. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the, bring, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And what I want to do is just review what this whole concept of abiding in Christ really is. We find two books of the Bible in the New Testament to be helpful for us. The first is Ephesians and the other is 1 John. 1 John is written by the same human author as the Gospel of John, and really, in a lot of ways, 1 John is a further description of many of the truths in the Upper Room Discourse in John chapters 13 through 16, and 17 as well in there. It's a further explanation of those things we find in 1 John. And in the book of Ephesians, we find the Apostle Paul's treatment of, of this whole concept that's in a different way. In Ephesians 4.13, it actually says, till we all come into the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is equated in Ephesians 3.19 to knowing God in a deeper way and to be known by God. In Ephesians 5.18, we have the very familiar verse of being filled with the Spirit. All of these are really talking about the same thing, abiding in Christ, being filled with the Spirit, knowing God, being known by God. They are really all talking about that same, the same concept and described in different ways for us to understand, have a fuller understanding of what these things are. In, we also have to, need to understand that there's a kind of a abiding perspective that 
we must have. We find that in Colossians chapter 3. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. The abiding relationship we found fleshed out in 1 John, and we find the concept of fellowship in 1 John. I've been teaching the teens for the last few weeks in Sunday school, and we talked last week about the concept of fellowship. Teens, what is fellowship? Can you all remember what fellowship is? I didn't know you were going to ask me here. right? What is it? Just one word. What is it, guys? Good. It's sharing. Fellowship is sharing. What we have with Christ is a sharing relationship. We share with him. He shares with us. We sh he shares his strength. He sh Christ, the amount of what Christ shares with us is immeasurable. What we share with him can probably be put on one hand. Worship, and there's certain things that we share with him. Adoration and pleasure and right behavior, those kinds of things. But there is this ongoing sharing work that we, we have uh, in our fellowship with him. And then finally, abiding in Christ has to do with a stability in life. Stability, first of all, in God's truth. We find that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 24 through 27. But also a stability in, in, in a confidence in God's presence. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence and, be ashamed, and not be ashamed, before him it is coming. Why? Because he's been with us the whole time. That is, when we are really abiding in Christ, there is a constant awareness of the presence of Christ in our lives. Can I ask you a question, Christian? As you live out your life, are you constantly aware of the presence of God? Is there an awareness of his presence, of his working, of his of his? communication with you through the Word. And then finally, finding stability in the position that we have in Christ in 1 John 3, 1 through 3. But there is this other concept that we find in verses 4 and 5 that sort of jumps out of, at us and is summarized in the final, ver, in the final phrase of, chapter, of verse 5. For without me ye can do what? You can do nothing. Without Christ, there is no fruit. Without Christ, there is no work that you and I can do that is of any eternal significance at all. That's why what is absolutely necessary for us to be able to abide in Christ is to have an attitude and a conscious dependency on Christ. Are you consciously and consistently dependent on Christ? That really brings us to shorted circuit number four, which is self-reliance. We, our culture does everything it can to get us to think that the answer to life is self-reliance. I just need to rely on myself. I can't trust anybody else. I'm just going to do it myself. And sometimes experience has showed us that. Experience has said that, told us that, you know, I, don't, you know, I might not be all that reliable, but I know others really aren't reliable. I'm more reliable than they are, so I might as well just do it myself. In other words, out of the options available, I'm the most reliable out of the options available. Folks, self-reliance will keep us from abiding in Christ. We cannot be self-reliant. We have to be reliant on Christ to do what we can't do for ourselves. That is, there's this conscience, conscious awareness of the need for Christ to realize that my life is going to end up useless and worthless if it isn't for Christ. And that every day of my life is going to be a day that I need to, to look to Christ for strength and to bask in His love 
and to be aware of His presence and to fellowship with Him and to do what He has asked me to do for His pleasure, to follow after Him closely. And when I do this, fruit will come, results will occur, and my life will be useful for Him, but only because of Him and never because of my own self-reliance. Christian, we have to fight this. We have to constantly be aware that if I do things in my own strength because of my own intestinal fortitude alone, that I am doing them with self-reliance. Now, this is not to say that we just don't have any kind of effort in our lives, that we're not diligent and we don't work hard and we don't do... Th- it's, not, it's not what it's saying at all. But what it is telling us is that if we are not, as we are doing these things, connected to Christ and in fellowship with Christ, they are not going to produce the eternal fruit that we otherwise could have. There are a couple of ways that this... That I want to really get this point across because it's important. There are a couple of ways that this occurs. Um, sometimes we follow the commands of Christ, but we fail to love Christ. You ever think of it that way? You, you know, we have our sort of list of things that we ought to do. And if we just follow that list of things we ought to do, then we know we're good. You know what? That sounds pretty simple, but it's, it's really wrong. You cannot think in terms of a list of things to do and to think, well, if I just do that list and I don't do these things, I do, do, do these things, and I'm good, and I know I'm good if I do these things and don't do these. Folks, that is not a loving relationship. What God wants from us is a loving relationship. It's an ongoing, day by day, knowing Him so, he knows, so we know what He wants for us. When you really know someone, you don't need to have them write a list for you. Some of us men need to learn this. I actually really like it when my wife writes lists for me. But really, if I want to know her, I, I have learned some things. I know what kind of flower she like, likes. It took me 15 years, but, or almost. But I know what kind of flower she likes. Now, I don't have, she doesn't have to write it down for me anymore. <laughs> you're like, you're really lame. <laughs> it took you that long. <laughs> it's true. The, the point I'm simply saying is, is that when you really know someone, there, it's this ongoing relationship. You know what they need. You're sensitive to, the, to what their pleasure is. You're sensitive to those kinds of things. It's an ongoing relationship versus, I'm going to do this, 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 and I'll be fine. If you're following a list, it's like you're, following, you're working for an employer. It's probably a, a good way to illustrate it. Instead of, instead of having a relationship like you're supposed to have in marriage or a close friend where you're wanting to please them and wanting to help them and wanting to love them, you're following an employer. Do you see God as your employer? Where you got to follow a list of things? If we do, it will, it will lead us to self-reliance. And by the way, we're not all that good at that. Right? And so we'll actually end up feeling defeated most of the time. But if we don't feel defeated, we'll end up like a Pharisee. Right? The Pharisee is really the perfect, the prime example of someone who did all the right things. But... Christ said, you are a whited sepulcher with dead men's bones in you. Christ was hardest on the Pharisees out of any other group of people because there was a sense of self-reliance and self-pride that he could not work with. It wasn't possible. So we need to think about those things and we need to ask ourselves, is there a sense of self-reliance that is keeping us from really following after Christ. Now, my time is up, and I want to just mention a couple of these things. We're going to review the the final ones next Sunday. All four of these are areas that if you look at these areas and you really think about them from time to time, these have probably, over the last nine months, been shorted. You've had them as shorted circuits in your life. I have. There have been times... Where, where at least some of these, maybe not all of them, but at least some of them, 
I have had to say, whoa, whoa, I am, I am short circuiting. It's not on there. We, I don't have a conclusion today. So don't, it, you're, you're good. And I just encourage you this way. I think, that, I think the helpfulness of doing it this way is that if we can have these in our minds, if we can identify and we can know, okay, I, that's a short circuit. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting into an area that I might l- lose my connectivity to Christ if I keep thinking that way or I can't keep doing that. I think it will help us to, 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 to be better equipped to abide in Christ. And I would just encourage you with these four areas to just take some time. In fact, what I would like you to do, I'd like us all to do this. I'd like us to just, just if you just bow, your, bow our heads and just, just in the quietness of our own hearts before the Lord, close our eyes, and just in silence before the Lord, go ahead and ask ourselves as we think through these, ask ourselves, okay, where, where am I where have I gone wrong? What is my tendencies? Where do I need to get a thinking adjustment? And just in your own time here, just pray before the Lord, in your own heart before the Lord. Lord, Lord, I have been self-reliant. Or Lord, I have not relied on my position in Christ. Or maybe your struggle has been resisting God's pruning. Whatever your struggle is, or maybe you've been trying to control your life instead of letting God have control of your life, and you're trying to plan things out, and you're getting frustrated. Just, I want, I want you just to take a few minutes in the quietness of your own heart before the Lord to to just ask the Lord for help with these things, and then we'll pray together in just a few moments.